All right, so in this video, we're going to cover four methods for constructing a classically damped matrix. The mass proportional method, the stiffness proportional method, Rayleigh damping, and the superposition method. So let's get to it. The mass proportional damping method assumes that the physical damping matrix, little c, is proportional to the mass matrix M by some constant, which we'll call A0. Now, in the context of a three-story building, it would look like the figure on the right, where we've added a damper to each story and fixed that to some fixed reference frame. Now, the value of the damper has to be that A0 times the mass of that story. Okay, And note in particular that the proportionality constant A0 applies to all stories. So we only really have one parameter we can tune in this method. But it should be clear that by doing it in such a way, we guarantee that our modal damping matrix is diagonal. So if we multiply and pre-multiply by our mode shape matrix phi, we get that the modal damping matrix is simply a scale version of the modal mass matrix. So the only thing that really remains is to choose A0 and we can choose A0 so that we lock in at least one modal ratio. So if we start from the definition of zeta i with relation to chip to ci, next we can substitute in the proportionality relationship to get A0 over 2 omega i. So if we rewrite this in terms of A0, we get the following. All right, so as long as we know what value we want for zeta i, which could be for any mode, we can determine the value of A0. Now, once that's locked in, the other remaining modes are going to be also locked in. So let's look at what the relationship between damping values for different modes would be. So let's say we are using the first mode, zeta i, to decide on the value for a0. Then we would get an equation like this. Next, we can use the same relationship to find an expression for an arbitrary damping ratio, zeta i. So what do we notice? Is that zeta 1 and omega 1 are fixed, and so the damping ratio zeta i varies inversely proportional to omega i. So that's an important property of mass proportional damping. Damping will tend to decrease with increasing frequency. Now let's look at stiffness proportional damping. The principle is much the same, except now we are setting the physical damping matrix as proportional to the stiffness matrix. In terms of our three degree of freedom building example, things are a little different. Now it behaves as though dampers were placed in between stories. In other words, the damping is proportional to the relative motion between each story, much in the same way that stiffness is. But again, it should be clear that the resulting modal damping matrix, big C, is simply a scaled version of the modal stiffness matrix, which again justifies that it's diagonal. So we're going to go through the same process we did before and look at how to define A1 in terms of some desired damping ratio for an arbitrary mode zeta i. We start from the same relationship as before. Now we have to express this in terms of k, so we'll convert both c and m into terms of k, and then we simplify. Notice that this looks very similar, except now the omega has jumped to the top instead of the denominator. And so we can rewrite this in terms of a1 now. And so again, assuming that we use the first mode to lock in a1, let's look at what that means for the other modes. Simplifying this, we get the following in terms of zeta i. So notice that the omega i and omega 1 have swapped places. So now 
zeta i is proportional directly to omega i. So this is a characteristic of stiffness proportional damping that the damping now increases linearly with increasing frequency. Next is Rayleigh damping, and this is simply a linear combination of mass and stiffness proportional damping. So as you notice, the damping matrix is defined as some term times the mass matrix plus some term times the stiffness matrix. Now note very importantly that A0 and A1 in this case are not the same as before. We'll have to resolve for them. But before we do that, let's show that this guarantees a diagonal modal damping matrix. So we have to do a little bit more manipulation here, but because the phi matrix distributes, we essentially get that the modal damping matrix is just a linear combination of the modal mass and modal stiffness matrices. All right, so using this relationship in the modal domain, let's come up with an expression for A0 and A1. We can always express everything in terms of M, so let's do that. And then the MI terms cancel out. And so we're going to express this in terms of zeta one this time. Okay, so notice that now zeta i is in terms of two variables. So there's two knobs we can turn. That means that we have the capability to lock in two values of zeta that we would like. So what we can do is we can set up a system of two equations. In this system of equations, we can solve for A0 and A1, given the values for two arbitrary modes, zeta i and zeta j. Any other damping value is going to be locked in based on that relationship. What we will find is that at lower frequencies, the mass proportional damping behavior will predominate, but at higher frequencies, the stiffness proportional behavior will dominate. The last method that we will consider is superposition, and this one has the advantage that we can specify every single modal damping ratio. The approach we're gonna take here is slightly backwards, so we'll start in the modal do domain and work our way to the physical domain. So we'll start with the equation of motion in the modal domain using our modal mass, stiffness, and damping matrices. Then we convert it to our generalized equation of motion for each single mode. And we'll start from the same relationship that we always do. This time, however, we're going to express this in terms of CI. And this gives us a formula into which we can directly plug in a desired value of zeta i in order to get the corresponding value of ci. And one by one, we can build up the modal damping matrix, like so. Once we have the modal damping matrix, then we can use the inverse relationship to calculate our physical damping matrix, like so. And that's it, quick and simple. Now let's wrap it up with a graphical summary of these four methods. These graphs are really useful for visualizing the impact that each choice of damping model has on the overall behavior of your structure. So let's start on the left with mass proportional damping and stiffness proportional damping. This curve here is your mass proportional damping curve. Remember that we said that damping for mass proportional damping is inversely proportional to frequency. So it starts to drop off pretty quickly and then levels out uh, for higher frequencies. By contrast, stiffness proportional damping increases linearly with frequency. And so we get this type of behavior here. Now recall that each of these methods allow us to lock in one value of damping. So let's say that for mode one, we have some specified value zeta. Okay, that means that at omega one, the natural frequency associated with that mode, both of these 
methods will cross, but then will separate everywhere else, right? So in the case of mass proportional damping, you're going to get lower damping at higher frequencies compared to omega-1. And for stiffness proportional damping, you're going to get higher damping values. Now let's hop over to the right where we're comparing Rayleigh damping to proportional damping. If you recall, Rayleigh damping allows us to lock in two values. So in this case, we have a specified zeta that we would like to lock in for modes I and J. So the curve looks like a combination of mass and stiffness proportional damping. Like I noted, mass proportional damping dominates at low frequencies and then stiffness proportional damping begins to dominate at higher frequencies. The exact shape of this curve will be determined by where the frequencies lie, but essentially you will lock in two points that cross the value of zeta. For proportional damping, you can lock in as many as you want. In this case, we're assuming this is a three degree of freedom model, so we can lock up to all three values, omega i, j, and k, to whatever damping value you want. In this case, we're using the same one, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. The key difference with proportional damping is that it is not well defined in the areas between the frequencies of the modes. So let's say you're using a Rayleigh damping model and you've defined a damping matrix based on some initial set of mass and stiffness matrices. Then you change your stiffness matrix such that your natural frequencies fluctuate. Well, you would expect the natural frequencies to result in a change in the damping ratio as well, but that change will be constrained to move along this curve. So you have some predictive power on where damping will fluctuate if your mass or stiffness matrix matrices change. In proportional damping, you have no ability to make that judgment. It's simply not well defined where your new damping values will end up if your mass and stiffness matrices change. So essentially, you'll have to recalculate every time you make such, such a change.